right, that's it. Pretty straight uh, forward uh, picture of what it looks like to be a Christian. See, here in Winston-Salem, we tend to think this is a religious city, so t- people tend to think, here's what it means to be a Christian. I listen to sermons, and I sing songs, and I get a free hour of childcare, and that is not what it means to be a Christian. It means to follow Jesus. Did you hear that? To actively, intentionally, explicitly follow Jesus and then look beside you and behind you and go, I wonder if there's anybody else, my coworkers, my classmates, my friends, my family, that I could help them find and follow Jesus. Guys, the gospel goes forward one relationship and one gospel risk at a time. And here's how it works. You take the risk and then you trust God with the results. This isn't easy. This is why we need models for ministry. Greg is a model for ministry. We've got hundreds of people like that in this church. It's like, what? you wanna know what an example is? An example is somebody you look to when you don't know what to do. An example is somebody that you look to when you don't know what to do. And we need models of what it looks like to be faithful to Christ. If you'll type two, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter one. I'm gonna meet you there in a few minutes in verse 12. And Paul will continue to share his life and be a model for ministry because Christianity is both taught and caught. So we'll get there in a few minutes. But first, I need to tell you one thing I'm really excited about. Uh, And it is our men's and women's events next month. Uh, This is going to be May 10th for the men, so mark your calendar. This is May 24th for the women. Uh, They're both Friday nights. And guys, if you want to know why I'm so excited about this, it's because I saw what God did last year through our men's night and our women's night. There's just something about getting the dudes together, okay, and having them sing and hear God's word. There's something about getting the ladies together. And guys, this year, I'm telling you, We're bringing in the best speakers we could find. John Tyson and Jen Wilkin are in town. I hope you guys are excited about this. Listen, John Tyson, you may have never heard of him, but he's he's been pastoring in New York, he's from Australia originally, pastoring in New York City for 20 years, writing a book right now on the shadows men fight. He's gonna be talking to us. Jen Wilkin needs no introduction. She is the Oprah for evangelical women, okay? Book writing, blog posting, podcasting, you, you, you know who she is. Guys, I'm, this is not hyperbole, especially for the women. I would plan on showing up early, as early as you can do it. Go to dinner afterwards. Because I'm just telling you guys, we're, we're, we're not even sure like how to put this on social media. Because as soon as people find out that Jen Wilkins in the state of North Carolina, they're going to come, from, I'm serious, they're going to come from Charlotte. And this is not a ministry to North Carolina. This is a ministry to our church. And so we really want you to show up, bring your, your, your friends from your community group, and it's a, gonna be a significant moment and marker in your life. So uh, let's pray, and then let's get to work. <clears throat> Lord, do something in the men's lives. Make them better sons and fathers and husbands and brothers. Uh, do something in the women's lives. Make them stronger wives and mothers and sisters and daughters. Do something uniquely in the moment as we've got someone coming from New York City and someone else coming from Dallas, Texas to bring your word, Lord. So we pray that it would really influence marriages and families. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, have you ever had your plans changed? Of course you have, you're human, right? This is what happens. Now, sometimes it's like, you know, your daily plans change. You're a mom of young kids, and then, you know, Tommy or Timmy is is sick, and plans are changed. And sometimes that's okay, and sometimes your plans change for the week, and, but guys, sometimes your plans change for your entire career. You go into a meeting thinking, I'm getting promoted, and no, you're getting fired. And then you have to have a new plan for your life, and you have to pivot, and that's okay. Sometimes your plans change for your entire life, right? You get an inheritance, you're like, whoa, new plans. Somebody dies close to you, and you're like, new plans. Today I wanna talk about Paul's ministry plan. If you'll type two, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter one, verse 12. He's gonna basically, I'll meet you in just another, one more minute. He's gonna explain his ministry plan. Let me tell you two principles for planning. You can take these to the bank. Two principles in planning, always plan with prayer, right? How many of us, we get in trouble in planning because let's be honest, we weren't really praying. And if you only plan and you don't pray, you end up in places and with people often that you shouldn't be. And if you only pray and you don't plan, then you're probably lazy, right? And you're using the spiritual excuse, let go and let God. And you're not understanding, yes, God's sovereign, but you're responsible. Think about if your life is a boat, there's two oars. One oar is praying and one oar is planning. What happens if you only use one of the oars? 
You go in a circle, some of you have been there, okay? Uh, the other principle is, is you plan in pencil. You don't plan in pen. You go out, you know, you say, you say what James says, if the Lord wills. That's what you say. Because you don't know. You're finite and you're fragile and someone's going to get sick and someone else is going to suffer. And, so, you know. and we know this, guys, because uh, think about just even a family vacation. That's like the smallest plan you could do. It's like, okay, could I plan something for one week? And then you find out last minute, the grandparents are coming. You're like, this changes everything, right? Um, guys, I want to talk to you today about having a ministry plan. Because here's what happened with Paul. Paul had a plan, but things changed. And so then he had trust. So, okay, here's a little more background. The church of Corinth had trust issues with Paul. Have you ever had trust issues? Of course you have, right? Maybe in your marriage, maybe in your business, maybe in your church. And trust is, trust is very much like momentum. Very much. They're like the same thing. Because, because trust is gained slowly and lost quickly. And trust has to be both given and earned. And so, so organizations and churches and families move at the speed of trust. So Paul's trying to regain trust Think about that. Organizations and families and churches move at the speed of trust. Like, have you ever met a church and they can't get anything done? It's like, why? Well, the deacons don't trust the elders, and the elders don't trust the staff, and the staff doesn't trust the congregation. It's a mess. So Paul's going to rebuild trust by sharing his ministry plan. Let me ask you, do you have a plan for your life? <laughs> That's going to be my challenge today. Because Paul's big idea today is our plans change, but God's promises don't, but we should still plan. In fact, the way that you know you're serious about your life, and this is really something good to know. Like, okay, okay, some, you might say, I know what I want in my life. I, I want uh, more romance in my marriage. What's your plan? So many people, I don't oh, no, you don't have a plan. I'd like to be healthier. What's your plan? I'd like to walk with God. What's your plan? Guys, we don't get to control what God does, but guess what? This is so cool. You get to control what you'd like God to do in your life. You get to control what you're planning and expecting and opening yourself up for. So what I'm gonna give you today is five principles for planning. And they're gonna kinda be, they're uniquely Christian, you'll see. But, the, and it's not gonna give you some formula. Think of more principles and pillars for your life. The first principle, Paul says this to them, my plan is to boast in God. That's the plan for my life. Here, I'll show you. Verse 12, for our boast is this. So there's that word boast. The testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so toward you. For we are not writing to you anything other than that, what, sorry, than what you read and understand, and I hope you will fully understand, just as you did partially understand us, that on the day of the Lord Jesus, you, here it is again, look at this, you will boast of us as we will boast of you. What's up with all this boasting? I thought Christians weren't supposed to boast. I thought pride is like the ultimate sin. I was actually reading this passage with my family, doing a little devotional at dinner or breakfast, I can't remember what it was. And I, I said the word boast, and you know, part of what I do is I'm just a keyword preacher, I just bring up words and talk about them. So I said to my kids, I said, what's boasting? And my seven-year-old says, oh, dad, it's not good. I said, do you know what it means, Elon? He said, I have no idea what boasting means. <laughs> Doesn't sound good, but I don't know what it means. All right, okay, there's a difference. So the problem with boasting is, like, like almost everything in the Bible, it's like, okay, you're supposed to do it, but you're supposed to do it in God's way. There's good boasting and there's bad boasting, right? And how many of our lives, if we could be really honest, and I know church is no place to be honest, but if we could be really honest, <clears throat> What's gotten us in trouble is our, our plan for our life was self-exaltation. Like that was the plan in the career. Like that's been the plan in kind of in your relationships. Is Because here's the thing, guys. We're gonna talk about good boasting in a second. But the bad boasting is, let's just call it bragging, okay? And bragging is where you share status elevating information with others. And we really don't like people who do that. I was reading an article this week on bragging. And it basically said there's four types of bragging. You can put all bragging into four categories. Category one, the bare bones brag, right? Most of us are not unaware enough, hopefully. Maybe some of us are. Or arrogant enough or insecure enough to do the bare bones brag. The bare bones brag is just when you, for some reason, strangely, just love to share all this positive stuff about yourself so that everyone thinks you're so great. We don't really like that. We tend to do the one-upmanship brag, he said. 
And that is among friends. Oh, really? You shot 80 for the first time in golf. My best is 75. <laughs> Just a little bit one-upmanship. He said, then there's the reciprocal brag. The reciprocal brag, so the one-upmanship brag you use with people who are your equals in status, because bragging is all about status. And the reciprocal brag you use with people who have more status than you. And they share something about themselves, and then you share similar information to say I'm at the same status. And then, they said the most popular today, because people know it's not good to brag, is the humble brag. You know what the humble brag is? It's like the subtle, sophisticated. It's like when you say, you know what, I'd love to be there, but just my family and I were very busy, and we have courtside tickets to the Duke game. We, I'm sorry. You know, it's, it's when you say something like, hey, you know what, I, I don't play that video game. It's too easy for me. That's, what, right? <laughs> that's, the, that's the humble brag. Paul says this, and wouldn't this be awesome if this was your life? Paul says, guys, here's like when I, maybe think about it this way. What should you do in planning? First, look up and say, here's my desire is to boast in God to be proudly confident of God, to glorify God is, is what you probably have heard it said before. And here's the interesting thing about Paul. <clears throat> Paul boasted in only two things, big categories. He boasted in what God was doing in Christ. And he boasted in what God was doing in Christians. That's it. So Paul's kind of a strange guy. Like in Galatians 6, he says, may I never boast except in the cross of Christ, which kind of sounds crazy. Why would somebody boast in crucifixion? Because of what it accomplished, the salvation of sinners. Paul said it changed his whole life. Paul's kind of strange. He says, I boast, by the way, he uses the word boast in 2 Corinthians alone 25 times. And he says, guys, I bo this is crazy. Later he goes, I boast in my sufferings. You're like, who boasts in their sufferings? And then here's something that none of us do. No, whose social media account is, is committed to this? I boast in my weaknesses. Paul's strange. But then... Maybe more practically and importantly, Paul would boast in what God was doing in other Christians' lives. I think that's really important because I think it's hard to know what God's doing in our life sometimes. I, I struggle with that. What, God's, what is God doing in my marriage? What is God doing in my heart? Right? I remember when I first got into full-time ministry, I know it doesn't look like it, but when I first got into full-time ministry, I started to work out. I know that's going to be a surprise to many of you. And... Um, it was, and I had to realize, why am I working out all of a sudden? It was because in ministry, I couldn't measure anything. Is that person repenting of the sin or not? Are they growing in Christ's likeness or not? Are they, being, are they becoming a more christ I, I couldn't figure it out, but I could figure out, could I lift more tomorrow than I did yesterday? So here's the, here's the principle, guys. A lot of times we don't know how we're doing, and we need someone else to come around and just boast about what God's doing in our lives. So God gets all the glory, right? But we get the encouragement. It's like, man, do you realize you're becoming a more generous person? Man, I'm watching the way that you deal with your wife and your kids and you're more forgiving and more gentle. I mean, what would it look like if every community group, if every relationship in here, it's like, man, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try to discover what God's doing in your life and I'm gonna celebrate it so that you can see it. Well, anyway, so that's the first thing. First thing he says is look up because my plan is not to boast in myself, that gets us in trouble. My plan is to boast in God. Second plan, he says, okay, after I look up, I look in. He said, look, at, listen, my plan is to be informed by my conscience. Let me show you this. So he looks out to God, but then he looks into his conscience. Look here. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience. Okay, so as soon as you have a plan for your life, and a plan for your marriage, and a plan for your business, okay, and a plan for evangelism, and a plan for to disciple your kids, the, here's the first thing that's gonna happen. Lots of trouble. Lots of left turns and right turns. Lots of hills and valleys. And it's like, well, what are you gonna be able to depend on? Because you're gonna have to have something to lean back on and go, am I doing this right? You go public with your faith, you're gonna have critics. You're gonna have to go, man, how am I gonna do this? You have to lean on your conscience. Your con God gave us an internal witness, that's the conscience. God gave us an external witness, that's the Bible. They're supposed to relate. I'll get there in a few minutes. We have to, okay, our conscience is, don't think shoulder angel, okay? That's, how it's, that's in a cartoon, but it, the conscience is the soul's warning system. The conscience is, here's what it does. It accuses you when you're doing something wrong, and it approves of you when you're doing something right. So this is why, like, you could take a stand for somebody at work, and you could do the right thing, and you could get into trouble at work, and then you go home, and you're like, I can sleep tonight, so strange though I got in trouble. Like, because the deepest part of you is like you did the right thing. 
So you have to be able, see what you wanna do now, and whatever, hopefully it's peacetime in your house, but in peacetime you need to strengthen your conscience, okay? You need to calibrate your conscience to God's word because you're going to need it, okay? Basically one of the ways, I'm not saying that we're the greatest here, but one of the ways that we made it through COVID is I didn't go against my conscience. Every week someone's saying something different. Somebody wants to do something different. It's like there's no way to make it through COVID except to follow my conscience. Well, I had to be able to trust it. Because here's an interesting thing about the conscience. Everybody's conscience is a little bit different. One of, there's two principles when it comes to the conscience. The first principle is everybody, every Christian's conscience is different, so it's called Christian liberty. It's like I let you have your conscience and you let me have my conscience. The second principle of your conscience is never go against your conscience. Okay, let's just, because I'm, I'm gonna talk more about the conscience in a second, but hold on. How many of you are just going against your conscience right now in some area of your life? It's like, forget the whole, you have some big plan for your life and you're gonna make some kind of big difference. Stop that right now. You need to stop going against your own conscience. It's like the first thing, say, like, all right, you, this couple is a horrible marriage. It's a two out of 10. Okay, here's what both of you do. Stop going against your conscience. Right? I mean, how many of you, there are things that you know you should not do that you keep doing? It's like, golly, if you would just stop doing the things that your own conscience tells you stop doing. It's like it would fix probably half the problems in your life. Well, that's the point of the conscience. Okay, but there are three types of consciences, the Bible says. There is the sensitive conscience, and some of you have this, okay? If you grew up in a very religious and moralistic environment, you tend to have a sensitive conscience. I'll give you a verse, I'll give you a passage. 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8, Paul basically, he doesn't use, I'm using the word sensitive. He uses the word weaker brother. And here's what Paul says. He's not making fun of him. He says, here's what happens. There, there, it's a long story. I can't get into all the details. There, there's basically some food that's been sacrificed to idols. And Paul's like, look, an idol is nothing. You can eat the meat. Okay, it's not a big deal. But there were some people whose consciences were so sensitive, Paul called them the weaker brother. They thought they could only eat vegetables and not eat meat. And Paul basically says, you live with the weaker brother in an understanding way. <clears throat> but if, you're, if your conscience is sensitive, you wanna strengthen it, but you never wanna go against your conscience. And there's a reason for this. Whenever you go against, here's how your conscience works. It goes like, it says like, the first time you go against it, it says, no. And then you keep going against it, it says, no. I wouldn't do that. Okay, fine. Uncle. And so you'll see this, okay? What happens with people is they will, the first time you lie to your spouse, very difficult to do. You sweat, you get in the other room, you're thinking about it, you wonder if you're gonna get caught. You lie five, six, seven times, it becomes pretty easy. Cheating on your test, cheating on your taxes, I mean, Anything, the first, your conscience will be strongest in the beginning and it will say, do not do this, but if you go keep going, it will let you go. Which leads to the second type of conscience. So Paul says there's a sensitive conscience, and then Paul literally says this. So Paul's writing to this young pastor named Timothy. And he says, hey, Timothy. <clears throat> he says, um, there's gonna be these crazy people that are gonna show up in your church. And he says, their conscience is seared like a hot iron. So there's other people. This is probably more common because of the culture we live in, where people their conscience lets them do a bunch of things scripture says they shouldn't. This is why, like, why do we care about the laws in our nation, right? Well, it's because, or maybe say it this way, why do people want things to be legal? Like, why do they want the government to legalize things? So their conscience won't condemn them. That's actually technically one of the reasons. Because when something's legal, you're kind of, oh, whew, okay, my government... The leaders of the land say this is okay, so this is okay, even though I know it's not okay. The, the seared conscience happens, and this is why people sometimes are like, I can't believe what I'm looking at. I can't believe what I'm doing. I can't believe how much I'm drinking. I can't believe how much pain medication I'm taking. It's like, okay, we know how you got here. There's lots of grace. We know how you got here. You got here not overnight, but over time by saying no to your conscience. What we wanna have is what Paul calls a spirit-filled, or I'll call what Paul's describing is a spirit-filled conscience. 
It's a conscience that's calibrated to God's word. Like the, when the conscience is working rightly, it fills the gap between what God's word says and where you're failing. And your conscience, connected to grieving the Holy Spirit, should lead you to repentance. That's how the conscience works. I mean, the conscience is so powerful, guys. I mean, it's basically, when I'm teaching, I'm trying to talk to your conscience. That's what I'm trying to do, if you ever just wondered. That's why most of the time I say things like, you know this. And it's like, you do know this. Well, then how do we build the conscience? This is like, okay, so let me give you a paradigm and practices to build your conscience, right? Because some of you, it's too sensitive and some of you, it's too seared and no, one's, no conscience is perfect. So here's what you do. <clears throat> you find biblical truth and you create personal convictions and that's how you build your conscience. I'll give you an idea. So a biblical truth is binding on all Christians everywhere all the time. Let me give you a couple practical ones. This will be helpful. Really, if you get this, really helpful. Um, <clears throat> biblical truth, do not get drunk. Right, as much as you may want there to be, there's no asterisk next to it with a picture of you, you know, on the back of the Bible saying, you know, she's the exception. Okay, um, there. So, so, so biblical truth, like, okay. Then you have to go. Well, then, what would be my personal conviction for me and my family based on this biblical truth? And some people would say, you know, I know a lot of people say, you know, I don't want to have ever have to have a last drink, so I'll never have a first drink. Okay, the teetotaler mentality. And hey, I don't want it to be a temptation. Uh, I don't want it to be confusing to certain people. And uh, my dad or my grandpa or my grandmother, this, totally fine. Other people might have a different conviction. You know what? I'm gonna drink on the holidays and at celebrations. Other people might have another conviction. I never drink alone. Other people have another conviction. I only have one or two drinks when I drink. Okay. Do you notice how the same biblical truth can inform someone's conscience to have different personal convictions? We have to get this, guys, because one of the, 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 the principle of the conscience is one of the foundational principles for the church to have unity in the midst of diversity. Okay, so home education, right? This whole idea that the Bible says that the parents are primarily responsible for the education of their children. I can give you tons of verses, like biblical truth. Okay, personal conviction might be homeschool, private Christian school, public school while being heavily invested, university model. I mean, who knows? There's so many options. See, what happens, here, here's where churches get weird and Christians get weird and goofy. When they try to make their personal conviction somebody else's biblical truth. And so here's the thing, the, the, here's what I found though. The strongest, most mature Christians that I know, I don't know if there's any exceptions to this, they have the most personal convictions. But they're also so gracious to anybody who would be different. Maybe the first place to start with a personal conviction would be take the biblical truth that you're to meditate on God's word day and night. That's a biblical truth. What's your personal conviction to get God's word in your heart? Is it Bible recap? Is it Bible in a year? Is it a psalm a day? Is it a book study? The principle is to say, okay, what is the, what are, I build my conscience by creating personal convictions based on biblical truth. Anyway, so helpful. Okay, third thing. So Paul says, I look up. <laughs> that's, that's my, I wanna boast in God. Then Paul says, I look in because I need to be informed by my conscience. And then Paul says, I look out. And Paul says, I want to be the grace of God in your life. This is, this is, this is exciting. This is really interesting. I want you to see this. Turn to me to verse 15. Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. Whoa. So just for a second, Paul goes, I wanna tell you why I'm coming to meet with you. Like, you know, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons we meet with people. Why we schedule lunch or get a cup of coffee or go to their house. And if we're honest, sometimes our motives are for ourselves. Maybe this is a good networking opportunity. Maybe I can get something out of this. Maybe there's some quid pro quo in all of this. I mean, again, none of us have ever had probably a perfectly pure motive in our whole life. But I love what Paul says. Paul says, I, I wanna tell you my motive. My motive is to come to you so that you can have a second experience of grace. I was reading that this weekend. I'm thinking, what is a second experience of grace? Well, it's different than a first experience of grace, right? You can't have a second experience of grace if you've never had a first experience of grace. The first experience of grace is when you become a Christian. We saw this at Easter. A couple dozen people raising their hands across our services, receiving Christ. The first experience of grace is when you welcome Jesus Christ 
into your life as your Lord, Savior, treasure. It's when you transfer trust from yourself to Jesus and believe that what he did 2,000 years ago counts for you. That's the, but then there's second experience of grace. Now here's my question. How many experiences of grace do you need? Answer, as many as you can get, right? That should be the answer. So where do you need the grace of God in your life? Because the grace of God is not just the forgiving grace of God. Well, that's very powerful. That's the beginning of it. That's grace 101. The grace of God is, well, it, the grace of God, by the way, is a fundamental human need. So most people think the fundamental human needs are food and water and shelter. They're, they're close. It's food, water, shelter, and grace. Those are, that's, grace is the fundamental need of the human soul. We need to be forgiven. Like, this is what we long for. We long for someone to know us as we really are and forgive us and love us. And that's the grace of God in Christ. But there's the forgiving grace of God, and then there's the transforming, empowering grace of God. The grace of God that the Bible says teaches us to say no to unrighteousness. Where do you need the grace of God in your life? Really? A lot of people need the grace of God in their marriage. I need a second experience of the grace of God in my marriage. That would be amazing. People need the experience of the grace of God in some fight with sin. They've made peace with sin. They've been managing their sin life. And they're like, I need the grace of God. People need it in their stewardship and in their finances. I love that Paul says, and this is, I really want you to do this because the Bible says it. And I want to I create a church like this. Paul says, I view myself as being the grace of God in other people's lives. Isn't that amazing? What if, guys, listen. The people in our lives that we're the closest to and we could show the most grace to, we tend to show the least grace to. No one could be the grace of God to a husband like his wife. No one could be the grace of God to a wife like her husband. No one can be the grace of God to kids like their parents. No one can be the grace of God to parents like their kids. What is wrong with us? That the very people we could show the most grace to, we don't. Paul basically says this. Paul says, like, here's my aim. I want to show up and I want to think about this. How can I be the grace of God in your life? I want to teach you a very helpful principle. I think it's going to make sense. Give me one second. It's going to sound confusing at first. Here's the principle. It's a psychological principle. It's that whatever you aim at, in life determines what appears to you. I'll prove it to you. Say you're a single girl and you really wanna get married. It's a good thing. Say you're a single girl, you really wanna get married. So your aim is to find a suitor. What is every single man? What does he appear? A potential date. Or maybe not a date. You're like, eh, not him. Okay, but, but have you ever met a guy? Okay, I'll give you another example. Say a guy is in sales. I know many of you are in sales. Nothing wrong with that, I'm saying. But say he's in sales and he's new in sales. He's got to, he's, his wife's staying home. He's got to make some money, right? So he gets what my dad calls commission breath. You know what I'm talking about? What happens, this can happen with a used car salesman. This can happen with a, with a realtor. This, this can happen with a life insurance guy, okay? And everybody, right? If you got to make a lot of money and you got to do this and you're starting out and you're whatever, what is everybody to somebody in sales? Like they'll walk into a room and they'll, they'll walk into church. They'll think, oh my goodness, who here could I sell something to? Because, listen, this is so important. Whatever you aim at determines what appears to you. Someone who's just in bondage to lust, what is every person of the opposite sex to them? A potential sexual object. Have you ever just met somebody who just loves money in general? What is everybody to them? They, they, I've met people like this, and they are just unbelievably fascinated with how much people make. Well, how much does he make? Well, how do they afford that house? Well, how do they get in that country couple? How do they send their kids to that school? It's like, dude, so interesting that you would see that family that way. You would literally see the family and you'd go on Z Zillow to figure out how much their house was. Like, what's wrong with you? Everything in your life's about money is what's wrong with you. So here's the encouragement. So that's, that's the critique. Here's the encouragement. You could aim differently. And then if you aim differently, just try this for a week. Aim at being the grace of God in the, your family's life or your friend's life and watch a bunch of things appear to you. Just try it for today. Go home. 
and think, today I will be the grace of God in my family's life. And then ask God, how can I be the grace of God in my family's life? And then here's what will happen. It'll be amazing. A bunch of ideas will appear in your mind that have never been there before. Why? Because you never aim there. You've been aiming at boasting in yourself or something like that. So Paul says, I want to be the grace of God. In fact, here's what he says. Look at this. Verse 16. He says, I wanted to visit you, by the way. Remember, they said, Paul doesn't want to visit us. Look what he says. He goes, guys, I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia. And then look at this. And to come back to you from Macedonia. Guys, you didn't think I want to visit you. I wanted to visit you twice. In fact, I wanted to have you send me on my way to Judea. I wanted you to partner with me in the gospel. He says, was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no, okay? In fact, let's just real quickly jump back up to verse 12 because he's talking about how he did ministry. Look what he says here. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, here we go, that we behave, by the way, that's the language of a pattern of behavior, that we behaved in the world with simplicity. When you read simplicity, that word does not mean minimalism. Here's what Paul means, the opposite of duplicity. That's what he says. I was single-minded, my life was about one thing. Look, in godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so toward you. Here's what Paul said, guys, guys, he goes, guys, look, when it comes to me, what you see is what you get. I want to encourage you, there's so much freedom in just saying, I'm going to have one life. That's what Paul's saying. I'm not going to have a travel life that's different than my home life. I'm not going to have a family life that's different than my work life. I'm not going to have a church, lo- church life that's different than my vacation life. I'm just going to be the same person in every place. That's basically what Paul's saying. Then he says this. This is really cool. So he says, I want to boast in God. I want to follow my conscience. I want to be the grace of God to you. And then here's the fourth, his, his plan. These are just pillars. These are, these are anchors for him. He, the fourth thing he says is, I want to be like Jesus. My plan in life is to imitate Jesus. Look here, I'll show you this. It takes a second. It's a little confusing when you first read it, but I want to, I'll show you this. For the son of God, it's like, okay, well, why are we talking? Paul can't help himself. He just loves to talk about Jesus. Okay, so, so here he goes. For the son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, okay, Sylvanius and Timothy and I, all all of us, the main point and person of our message was Jesus Christ. Look here. And I was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. Okay, this may seem like, why is Paul telling this? Here's what Paul's saying. Guys, I want you to know my motives were pure because I'm trying to live like Jesus. That's why he says, wait, Jesus is, he's always yes, and so his yes is yes, and Jesus' no is no, and so I want you to know that my yes is yes, and my no is no. He, he basically is saying something that we've forgotten in the American church today. It's, it's that I would like my life and my ministry and my family or my work, or I'd like it all to say something about Jesus and communicate true things about Jesus. See, in even, this is a, if you don't know this, this is a Bible-believing, evangelical, Protestant church. And in those types of churches, I don't think you can overemphasize it, but in those types, in churches like ours, we talk a ton about faith in Jesus Christ. Like, we'll call you to believe. We'll sing songs about believing in what Christ has done in his life, death, and resurrection. We'll, and I believe all this. And we'll talk, we'll talk about how faith unites us to Christ. And we'll talk about how faith links us and changes us, and I believe in all that. But we've forgotten something, and and what's interesting, in 2,000 years of church history, you know, the church has dealt with and talked about and wrestled with everything. I think the moment, this moment in in the life of our church or the Church of America is what we have forgotten is what theologians have called the imitation of Christ. When was the last time you thought, how would Jesus live if he was living my life? What would Jesus Christ do if he was in my marriage? How would Jesus Christ do this job and career if he had it? See, we don't ask that question anymore. About 25 years ago, right, right around there, it was, there was a really popular bracelet. Some of you may still have it on, okay? The WWJD bracelets. Remember these? We're going to give you one when you leave. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, 
the, you know, I had one for a season. And um, the people have different, different perspectives on this, okay? Some people think it's cheesy. I actually, the more I think about it, I'm like, I think it might be the deepest question a person could ask. If they're sincerely asking it, I'm like, what would Jesus Christ do if he was living my life? It's like, here's the, here's what's, here's the honest truth. We don't wanna ask that question because we don't wanna answer it. What would Jesus do if he had as much money as I did? Okay, you don't wanna answer that question. And so we're in the dark because we're supposed to imitate, guys. And the only way to imitate someone is to spend a lot of time with them. So as you spend time in prayer and you spend time in God's word and you read the gospels and you see who Christ is, you should have more and more of a desire to imitate. This is all, this is what kids imitate their parents. Friends, as they grow up, they imitate each other. People imitate celebrities all the time. It's like imitation is the highest form of flattery. What would it look like for you to take seriously? Like, what does it look like for me to try to live like Jesus as I live my life? Anyway, that's what Paul's saying. That's what I'm trying to do, guys, so you can trust me. And when I need to repent, I'm gonna repent, but the direction of my life and the pattern of my life is to follow Jesus. Look, look what he says, <clears throat> just quickly. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen. So basically he says, the promises of God lead to us praying. Do you see that? All the promises of God are yes in Christ, so therefore we pray. Utter our amen to God for his glory, and it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, and who has put his seal on us and given us his spirit, there's the Trinitarian nature of all this, in the hearts as a guarantee. So basically Paul says, he points us real quickly to the promises of God. And he says, look, I'm gonna make promises and I'm gonna try my best and I'm gonna keep my word. But you know, Paul's like, I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to keep every promise I ever make. Like, what if I say I promise I'm gonna come back and I get put in jail or I get killed? And so he says, he points them to the promises of God. You can think about the whole Bible. It's a big book, I know, but you can think about the whole Bible as command and promise, command and promise. Like, go ahead, open up your Old Testament. Like, outside of describing something, all it is is command and promise, command and promise. And Paul's saying something really profound that maybe we take for granted in the church. He's saying all of the promises of the Old Testament have found their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. He's what's called the hermeneutical, meaning interpretive key of the entire Old Testament. God said he'd save us, and God said he'd forgive us, and God said he'd take us home, and God said he'd deal with our sins, and he did all of it in Christ. And so here's what he says at the end, and this is what I'm, I really want us to just spend a few minutes on, and I really want us to get this. Look at me at verse 23, the final part of Paul's plan. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. So, so basically, real quick, Paul looks back now and goes, I couldn't see it through the windshield, but I can see it through the rear view mirror. It actually worked out well that I couldn't visit you when I wanted to. Basically, Paul's gonna say, because I was angry. And I wouldn't have dealt with you the way I should have dealt with you. And I'm in a lot better place now. So God's using all of this for your good. And then here it is, guys. Here's where we have to just camp out before we close. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. I don't normally, I don't know that I've ever said this before, but I think more than maybe any other verse in the Bible, this could be a life verse for some, for some of you. You, you don't have to have a life verse. A lot of people do have a life verse. They have a verse in the Bible that goes, this is a controlling, defining sentence for me or passage for me or parable for me. Guys, what Paul basically says there is he gives a description of Christian ministry, which is also a description of parenting. He gives an incredible description. And first he says what we shouldn't do. Do you notice that? He basically says, guys, this is how to do ministry wrong. This is how to be a bad community group leader. This is how to be a bad dad. This is, this is how to be a bad pastor. He says, I'll tell you how you do it. You lord it over them, right? How many of you are a little tyrant in your home? You're like a little dictator. And you use your authority and you use your influence and you just, you just put it on people to get things done. What's interesting is, first thing about lording it over, this is good to know about lording it over people. It doesn't work. 
Have you ever tried to lord something over your wife? It's like, she's not going to put up with that. Right? I mean, here's, here's how, whenever you try to lord over people, basically, it makes them want to do the opposite. Unless they absolutely have to because you're their parent or you're their boss and there are going to be consequences. And so then they will do the least amount possible just so you'll leave them alone. So you need to know that lording it over people doesn't work. Jesus warned against lording it over. He says, guys, he says to the disciples, he says, guys, don't be like the Pharisees and the scribes who lord their authority over people. He says they give people just a bunch of burdens and they don't ever lift them. And what I'm surprised at, and maybe I shouldn't be surprised at, and I'm not here to call out any one name or anything, is like, that this is a big issue now with pastors. What's interesting is it used to be, you know, if, if somebody had like, was out of ministry, you're like, all right, it must have been a financial or a sexual, you know, compromise of some sort. It's like, that, that certainly still happens. But what I'm seeing more with the podcasts that are coming out, with the stories that hit the news, it's like about a domineering pastor. I remember reading one story. It's like on a baptism Sunday, he preaches, calls for baptisms goes backstage and screams at his campus pastor for 15 minutes with words that I wouldn't be able to say out loud here. And we're all inconsistent, but you wonder, what's going on there? What's broken in someone's heart? See, in ministry, I'm not talking about what I, I'm just saying, in, in the Christian life, there are always three temptations to go wrong in Christian leadership. There's, or, sorry, there's compromise. And how do you get there? Well, you get there by going against your conscience. I won't revisit that, we talked about it. Then there's coasting. We talked about that last week. I know lots of pastors who coast, right? It's like, okay, air-conditioned job, get to be in my study all day, get to eat lunches with people, this is fun. Coasting. The temptation to coast is to have a saved soul and a wasted life, we talked about that last week. But the third temptation is to control. Paul says, guys, there's a better way. He says, what if you work with people for their joy? What if from now on, <laughs> you, you know, because I think what Paul's doing here is he's describing, he's describing what it looks like to be the grace of God in people's lives. So if, when I said earlier, if I said, be the grace of God in someone's life, and you said, Kyle, that sounds kind of nice and romantic, but how? Here's the answer. You work with them for their joy. What if the, what if the mindset you had was like, you know what? <laughs> You could be more joyful than God and I could help. And that would actually, and actually here's the other second part of that, and nothing would make me more happy than to do that. I mean, wow. Is there anything better than having someone in your life to go, dude, I will work with you for your joy. You're too happy in your sin and I'm gonna work with you for your joy. You love money too much. I'm coming alongside you to work with you for your joy. You're about to give up in your marriage. I'm coming to work with you for your joy. See, what Paul understood is that joy takes work. And guys, we're trying. I mean, every, every Sunday, and I'm probably gonna feel this the whole letter, I just get up here and I'm like, ah, God, how do you build a church like this? Like, I, it's one thing to get people to come to your weekend or get in community groups, so that's great. How do you get people to be workers for joy? Because it's gonna take work, guys. I'm not trying to make this about me, but you know, every Monday, I'm never ahead in sermon planning, just for the record. So every Monday, just like your job, I gotta start all over, you know, and I'm looking at a blank screen and sometimes I'm having a pity party for myself. And I shouldn't be, but, but it's like, you know what? I'm committed from now on. My, my, I'm like, you know what I'm doing? When I'm in my study by myself, I'm working for the joy of this church. That's it. You know that? And so, no, it's not about me though. But here's like, no, no, it's okay. I appreciate that. No, but what I mean is like, if you're a community group leader, it's like, it's, I know you got to put an hour or two in. It's like, what if you were saying, I'm working for my, the joy of my community group? Like what? I mean, that is so incredible. What if you're going to just meet someone and they're a little difficult and you got to help her out and she's got a difficult marriage. You go, I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to work for their joy. Well, I, I tell you how to do it. You got to think four things when you're doing this. The first thing you have to think about, and some of you are going to think about this for yourself. You have to think, where is this person spiritually? Are they a believer? Are they not a believer? Are they a young believer? But then there's a deeper question, which is this. Why are they there spiritually? Well, that's the pastoral, that's the compassionate question. Heard a story one time, imagine this. Guy is addicted to Diet Coke. He just, he just I wanted to get done. He was, done, he was like drinking 10 Diet Cokes a day. And you know, his friend who's trying to help him, he just yelled at him one day, like got a lord over him. I was like, dude, get, get rid of the Diet Coke. It's so stupid that you're addicted to something like Diet Coke. And the guy said, you know what? I never told you. I started drinking this when my dad died 
or my brother died. He loved Diet Coke. I started drinking, I got addicted. The guy's like, oh my gosh, I knew where you were. I didn't know why you were there. The third thing is where could they be? I mean, some people have never dreamed about their lives. They've never thought it could be any different. And you come alongside and you go, it could be different. And then the next one is, what is their next step? And that's why he says, we work with you. What you say in Christian community is, look, let's pick a step small enough that you actually could take it and you would take it and you know you should take it. And then I'm gonna do it with you. So if you'll just bow your heads, if you'll close your eyes, we're just gonna pray this over our church, that we would be workers for joy, that we would be the grace of God in people, that we would not go against our conscience. We're not playing church. Lord, would you help us? There's a, there's a, everybody in this room could be more joyful in you than they are. And for some people, they're just depressed. And they're anxious and they need someone to say, I'll work with you for your joy. I'll come alongside you. Other people, they're, they're, they're finding some joy in some things they shouldn't be. And they need a Jesus that's better than their sin and bigger than their suffering. Lord, I just want to thank you for our community group leaders. I want to thank you for our elders. I want to thank you for our staff, people who uniquely wake up and they think about all day long working for the joy of this church. Lord, I pray this church would be the happiest group of people in Winston-Salem because our joy would be in the Lord and we would be committed to working in the lives of others that they might be happy in Christ as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.